everyone, welcome back. I'm author S.C. Coleman, and today we'll be talking about what exactly is the deep state. Now, rather than approaching this from the usual angle or perspective, we'll start by talking about the importance of French. Now, in most works of propaganda, the idea of studying French is considered to be in various labels, elitist, or uh, an attempt to look sophisticated. Essentially, it's derided as something that a snooty person does, or somebody who's attempting to appear snooty, essentially. And the reason for that is, in the past, mostly everyone spoke what we know today as French. And those that study French have a more advanced understanding of the past versus the fake historical accounts that we are fed today. Now, the reason behind the caricature of somebody who studies French as being a pompous idiot or a jackass, basically that's to dissuade the understanding that comes with learning French. In the past, or at least today, the language known as English is not English. It is primarily influenced through French, not Latin. Latin, just like English, is a modern invention. It did not exist at the time the label did not exist, and in many cases, the language structure did not exist. The illiteracy of the past is associated with modern Latin. Naturally, people in the past did not speak nor write modern Latin, just as they did not speak nor write modern English. Instead, they mainly spoke what we today call French. Now, French is the foundation or provides the foundation for modern concepts, the French language, like finance and business, as well as legal, which has to do mainly with finance and business. The modern languages at the time didn't exist, and the other languages of importance are Dutch or German, which is the same language, essentially, and Diggy and Sue. That's because of the American continent of North America, the Gyansu, being called the main language family across the northern section of America. None of these languages are related to Latin. The most related language to Latin, of course, being Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian. French is not. The entire characteristic of French is uh, unique. It uh, includes a combination of various other influences. German and Dutch, in addition, are very unique, and then so is De Guy and Sue, and all of these things come together. Now, the influence of De Guy and Sue can be found in the responses of uh huh and uh uh among others. These are mainly American Indian influences. Uh, the use of regular words generally comes from German or Dutch, whichever you wish, wish to say, but the majority of words comes from French. Specifically, anything that has to do with government, business, etc. The reason why we have a warped understanding comes from the cardinal principles on the reorganization of secondary education, a government bulletin from 1918 made by the uh, association, education association, essentially, um, what we would consider today to be a governmental structure, but at the time they would have simply considered likely to have been nothing but another independent corporation. 
Now what they did through this document is they established the modern structure of understanding mainly through lying or overlays of lying. The classification of languages is one of those. Most people in the past spoke language for communication purposes. There was no rigid classification structure like we have now. And the rigid classification structure we have now is designed to confuse and to force adherence, not out of the desire to communicate, but rather to dis control language itself. Now, when you study even modern French, you'll start noticing words that we have been taught mean one thing because of this cardinal principles school structure, but actually have more meanings than one, and the concept behind it is what's important. The first of those would be enforcement or enforcement. It is something that is done through strength, force being the French word for strength. It is out of strength. It doesn't have to be physically violent. It is simply done some, something done through strength. It's something, it's like a stronghold, right? It's founded in strength. Military is the French of militia essentially speaking the same word. We spell it with a Y, and the French might spell it with IE at the end, but it is still the same word. Jury is, or jure, the French for to swear, is where we get our word, of course, jury. It's the same word. But we, of course, have our understanding of what that actually means warped by a continuous repetition of a lie. Community, again spelled with a Y in so-called English, is a French word, spelled I-E. Police, or policy, or police, whichever, spelled I-E, is a French word as well. And that comes to the idea of a policy in, in practice. A policy meaning what you will at that time carry out. You can change policies naturally. Loi or law, L-O-I, is the French word that we call L-A-W, said the same way, spelled slightly differently. Arrest means to stop, or as it would be spelled arrête today in modern French, but it just means to stop. So, when someone stops you on the road, they are in fact arresting you. It's just a stop. And in the past, as you can read in old literature, arrest was not used the way that we do ubiquitously today. Reglement is where we get the word regulation. Declare, to declare something, is also French. Cart, or card. Verify, or verify, publi, public, publication, and Arthur, or Arthur, or author, whichever, all come from French. Now there's a character called Paul Revere, who is across our modern structure of indoctrination taught to be a real person, a public figure, a historical monument. Something to not be questioned, essentially. That relates, in fact, to the Le Petit Revier, or the Awakening, which is the word for the music played to awaken troops at every military base across the United States, which is in contrast to the one they use in England where we allegedly come from, and the reason why our language is called English, despite the fact it is not, in fact, English at all. This was used... Now, the idea of Paul Revere is that he rode through different towns and shouted that the British were coming. 
when in fact that would have been a courier service. Well, it wouldn't have been a courier service, actually. It would have been simple, regular individuals who were bugle players who would ride through the towns sounding reveling, which is what we call uh, reveille. We call it reveling. And that would awaken all troops, essentially. Anyone who was a veteran who had military experience, they would recognize that sound because it's played in military camps and on bases. And it's a very old custom. And so even today, it would be a little bit weird. But at the time, everyone would have known what that sound meant if they had actually fought or served in any sort of military capacity. And that means that they were mustering actual experienced soldiers to fight the British Marines, mind you, wearing red coats, uh, sent in by the Admiralty Court at Boston to take munitions from Lexington and Concord. I'm sure there were others, but anyway, they got wind, as the story goes, that there were munitions being stockpiled there. And thus, the story of Paul Revere was resurrected out of the uh, idea of distorting the past so that the same tactic could not then be used again to raise up veterans to fight. That's, of course, because we're living under occupation forces who see the uh, martial order and military experience as essentially enemy uh, capability. Now, historically, there have chronologically been very obviously certain periods of human liberation movements. The cardinal principles of secondary education from which our school system comes desires above all else that these movements of human liberation do not be realized because they're done against those that instituted the school system. The first was the Mongol so-called uprising of 1200 to 1400, and in some cases extended further beyond. The Mongols, as they're called, started essentially the first human liberation movement. As far as we can tell with our distorted history, Chinggis Khan and Timujin did not actually exist. That individual is a fabrication designed to obfuscate the truth, which is that a large nomadic population of slaves from Asia all the way to um, Eastern Europe, essentially, because that's about where they stopped, and of course North Africa, they decided, because uh, they had essentially underground alternative methods of communication that were not controlled. And that is the main capability that allowed them to liberate themselves and a large number of others join them from different cultures and that's the reason why you get a coalition force not under a dictatorial ruler like they like to say but actually a movement rising up out of their own volition every single individual choosing to do it themselves with no actual figurehead or commander there were no head of the snake as it were and that's the reason why you get mongol sieges that involved Every form of siege craft, every form type of warrior, people from different cultures, Italians, French, Middle Easterners, you know, uh, at least as we would label them today. But it was a different time and they didn't use labels like that. They didn't call people the same way we do. And so when you put that modern overlay on history, it is being done to obscure the past so that the past does not repeat itself in that context. Now, the Mongol uprising, as we'll call it, from the starting in the 12th, 1200s, and uh, in some ways ending in 1400s as far as the official narrative goes, that freed up communication. That was the big thing, which allowed for the spread of dangerous ideas as far as the control structure is concerned and led to the rise of North African called Pirate Republics, or the Age of Piracy. That would have been the 1400s to the 1800s, when uh, essentially the 
as far as the official narrative goes, the North African independent republics ended in 1830 with the occupation of Algiers by the French. Now, a lot of that's false, of course. The French were in Algiers independently of the French crown for a long time. And that's mainly where the French influence in Algiers actually comes from. Independent French separated unlawfully, as the crown would say, from that territory. Now, the control structure, they had a major problem with these so-called pirate republics because they were spreading ideas outside of the controlled mechanism. The control of information has been at the heart, essentially, of all of these human liberation movements and all of the suppression movements to keep control in the hands of essentially the same group that's been doing this for a long time, the ones who are in opposition to human liberation. Piracy, of course, and pirate are French words, not English. They are a accusation levied against those at the time who were acting without the leave of the crown, hence why today we're taught that those who had volition or who had uh, permits from the crown were then called privateers, not pirates. However, on the other side, the North African republics did not recognize this, and they would hang for piracy as a joke, probably, those they caught uh, under crown permit, permission, or permit. Of course, naturally, the pirate republics led to what is termed today in the uh, modern context independence movements, or the so-called Age of Enlightenment. Another term for that that would be more applicable would rather just be constitutional human liberation or freedom movements. And those naturally started around the 1700s, did not start with the United States as we are constantly taught, and then went into the 1900s, in fact some even later into the 1980s, and so on and so forth around Africa. In each case, we are always lied to, and the truth of the fact of, of what is going on there is always obscured for fear of that information actually threatening their control, because this will always revolve around information. And so even reading, once you know French and you know what these concepts are, you can follow the Owen Barfield concept of history written in language itself, following the trail of, through the language and learning history through that way, which is a very difficult mechanism to destroy as far as historical accounts go. The language does not add up to the modern account. That is an anomaly that happens when you're lying and you're trying to distort the truth. Now, in addition, if you know French and you know all this stuff, then you can, in some ways, decode, even in the case of a manipulated narrative, the truth through history that has been changed or lied about. And this comes down to, like I said before, finance and business. It's not just about what we term legal, even though those concepts are actually united. They're not different. They're the cardinal principle structure separates things. It compartmentalizes them when they would normally be unified into one context. Now we have Le Fon, or the Fawns, as we might pronounce it. Now, this is the idea of keeping a fountain of information, essentially, by keeping documents, and this is what the official narrative for it is, anyway, together that have the same origin. There's, of course, a lot of other thing that, things that come from this, and then we have the word respect des fonds, or respect des fonds, and that is not using the word respect in the way that we have inaccurately been taught is the definition of that word, but rather the idea of 
pertaining to or looking at something. That is how the French word respect works. Now, this is idea that you respect the origin of documentation by keeping them together. Now, if you understand this concept, which all has to do essentially with verification and the idea of uh, so-called archival science, when you understand this concept, and most you'll, you'll see that mostly today this is used to falsely authenticate fiction. You have uh, a originator of fraud, and you keep all of those together so that you can use one piece of fraud to verify other pieces of fraud. This, of course, is a concept, concept that's little understood today, because if it were, then, well, the control structure people would be in a lot of trouble, because that means people would be able to easier, more easily identify a whole body of work made out of fraud versus the legitimate article, of which we have very few examples of legitimacy when it comes to documentation, because they have essentially the liars and, and obfuscators have been controlling our archives, as far as most of us are aware anyway, our entire lives. Now the next idea that here, the main concept is that it revolves around a fountain and energy in water. And that's when you get into sourcing or sorcier, a source of a fountain or a sorcerer. A sorcerer is somebody who deals with sources or sourcing something, making a source. And this is the same concept around a fountain pen, and this comes from the idea, the French idea, of reservoir, or to resave, is one way you could look at it. A fountain pen is a reservoir and contains a reservoir, as it's called, of ink. And through that mechanism, you make a fountain of words from your reservoir of ink. And when your reservoir of ink runs out, you have to get a new one or refill it with ink. It stops working. Same idea with, of course, a fountain. A fountain is sourced from somewhere. It spews out water. <laughs> Oftentimes it has a reservoir or a well attached to it. And this, of course, is the idea of a general fund or a sinking fund. Sinking fund is the idea that you have a fund of, uh, for monetary purposes, which has no bottom. It keeps sinking because you keep adding to it. It has no limit to how much can be stored in that. That's what the idea of a sinking fund is. A revolving general fund usually has a limit that it can contain in it at any one time. And so before more can be put into it, Think some has to be taken out, the stuff like that. But you know, there's different concepts there. But it all revolves around the idea of a reservoir. And additionally, when the reservoir runs dry, you have a drought. It's empty, no longer usable. And the same goes with finance. Now we get the leave, French word for pound, and the pound sign symbol not the not the pound sign for a, a phone but the pound symbol for british pound currency pound sterling is an l with a slash through it that is additionally the sign for leave or the french pound of which they no longer use of course they use the euro now and of course all of this stuff revolving through our as we're taught france is another obfuscation because a lot of this stuff was in many ways global at the time reaching from japan to south america to africa india north america everywhere and everybody spoke french you know even a lar large portion of canada still speaks french most of africa speaks french uh parts of south the south pacific you know they're, and they're not French at all. They just speak what we call French, which is the same thing as us in, in America speaking English. We don't speak English, and they don't speak French. But either way, the modern concept of French is the foundation for globally most of these concepts. 
which did not necessarily originate out of France, what we know as the territorial land country of France, country meaning land, but rather out of the sharing of information and concepts through a common medium. That's what we're talking about here. Next, you have soul bits. That's a common currency. Uh, and then you have provenance. Provenance being another French word that has to do with the archival science and finance. Now, moving on from that, we'll go ahead and look at legal. The legal concepts which come from French. Beyond the usual ones of jury, police, arrest, things like that. Well, look at the actual word for a so-called juridical expert, an attorney. Most people understand an attorney to be licensed. But the license which they're given is to be at tournée, or at a tournament, the French tournament. This comes from the word tourner, tournée, or as you would say, tournez-vous is a way to tell somebody to turn around. And in any contest of, uh, of a adjudicated nature, like chess or a tournament with arms, say jousting or with swords, generally you take turns. This word naturally coming from French. And so at tourneys are actually playing at a tournament, taking turns. And that's essentially what they do. There's no actual practical reality. There's no juridicalness, as in there's no real oath. There's no enforcement. There's no strength. There's no legitimacy to what they do. They're simply playing, and anybody that goes along with their games is choosing to engage in a rigged game, basically. They've rigged that game. Just like you go into a casino, and the house always wins, it's the same thing. And this, when you understand this, you can understand what the deep state is. And this comes into the idea of banking, a not-for-profit, and a government or corporate body. The past structure, as far as the human liberation movements go, the way they structured it, the easiest way to understand this would be as a not-for-profit structure, what we would call not-for-profit corporation today, which instead of having outside investors or foreign control, foreign to those inside of it, the not-for-profit is structured and controlled by those that it affects. It is, uh, for all purposes, part of an open society. It's open, it's free, it's understood, it's out in front, it's not hidden in any way at all, and it is controlled by those inside of it that are affected by it. The closest thing we could possibly come to, to know of this would be a not-for-profit association controlled by the members inside of it and with no strings free of any encumbrance from so-called foreign investment or foreign control, mainly being someone outside of that organization controlling it uh, on behalf of those inside of it or on behalf of themselves. There's the none of that. In the original human liberation type of structure, what we call maybe a constitutional republic, of course there's many different concepts of constitutional republics, now, this came out of the Ancien Regime, is what it's called, or the Ancient Realm. 
And that was, the structure of that was a crown corporation where all of the profit, and it's for profit, right? All the profit gained was designed for the crown and the kingdom, the good of the realm. In that context, every individual in that structure is property and works for the crown corporation. And the benefit of the people in the crown corporation is not directly for them, like it would be in a not-for-profit member-owned organization and member-controlled. Instead, it's for the crown, and you want your subjects to be happy for the benefit of the crown, not for them. That is in contrast to what we have today. What we have today is a for-profit structure which is controlled by a secret society. It is not an open or public society. We're not actually aware that it's going on. So the way to think about this is you have a front-facing corporation, the so-called corporation, U.S. corporation under the U.S. Constitution and the U.S. Code, is the front-facing element we call government. And it is controlled from behind by the so-called non-profit entities of secret societies. Those secret societies are the ones that structure and control everything, but they do it in secret behind the veil of the front-facing corporation, and they continue to keep us believing that we're living in that position of a member-controlled, through voting, of course, and elections, the member-controlled public interest nonprofit entity, of which we're not. It's a for-profit entity controlled by a secondary source from behind, and they are the, the veil as it were. So that's the main difference there. We have differences, actually. We have the Ancien Regime, a crown for-profit corporation, open and public, all that. Then you have an open and public member-controlled nonprofit organization, who, which benefits all the members, of course. Or it could be for-profit in some cases. It just It really depends. And then that comes into the facade of the public controlled membership organization where in fact you have the real control behind a secret one. So there's a, a couple weaknesses to this secret society structure and to understand this everybody who is not involved in the secret society is involved in the front facing corporation and is Everything that's done is done for the benefit of that secret society and not for anyone else. So you are not kept happy. They don't care about that. They simply care about maintaining control and all things that are chosen and done are done for the benefit of that secretive layer behind the front facing veil. In some cases, it's worse than a crown corporation. So there's a couple weaknesses for this structure that will be inherent in it with naturally the necessity for secrecy. That is inherently a weakness. Mostly with all these secret society so-called groups of which they are form part of a master secret society, there is a pattern of studying trickery or illusions, showmanship, sleight of hand, card tricks, things like that. Generally with these people, they tend to practice those types of surface level misdirections, uh, tricks, um, showmanship, things like that. But there's other elements to this such as with numerical keys, your social security number, um, 
your birth certificate number, a different passport number, different identifying numbers, those are all numerical keys. And there are master keys, which can be wielded and used by those that control them to essentially void out your social security number. The example of this context would be when you go to your company or corporation and instead of just firing you, the way they do it is they will simply revoke your access to the building. Suddenly you go in, your key card doesn't work, you've been taken off payroll, you don't get money anymore, they just literally cut you off. That's how this works. When you get your security number voided, you are cut off as far as that front-facing corporation goes. And there's nothing you can do about it because it's all based on numerical keys. And then naturally you also have the financial grants, which are leashes that come from a reservoir where you have fundraising, funds collected and come in, donations or taxes, so-called uh, municipal public works payments, all of those things go into revolving general funds and then come back out in the form of grants with leashes attached to them. And that is another primary level of control and it is all done through the authentication of numerical keys. Numerical, of course, meaning a series of numbers or letters, a code. So naturally, if you're able to get your hands on a master key and the authentication codes that give access to financial reservoirs or result revolving general funds, then you have the ability to cause a great deal of damage to this system and structure where if you did it for your own personal gain, you would naturally get this whole structure wielded at you. And even if you did it to attack them, you, you know, you're dealing with an enemy structure because everything's about doing stuff for themselves, not for anyone else. So if you can get those, uh, those numerical keys, then you can authenticate the ability to zero out in one way or another their revolving general funds and reservoirs, which is in some ways the equilibrium to their control structure. Apart, of course, from the indoctrination system. They need all of those funds to keep their system going, like gasoline in a car. You take that away, they're dead in the water. But they can, of course, raise more and find other ways and move it and stuff. So it's not a completely, it's not the singular approach that will work, but it will certainly cause damage to their structure. Now, another weakness is the fact that everything's done through paperwork authentication and these numerical keys. You as an individual are not considered part of the authentication measure. There is no biometric or life signature, as far as I'm aware anyway. In some cases there are, like when I, you join the military, you have to take a biometric signature. When you go into the police station, you get fingerprinted, right? Those are biometric signatures. Most of the time though, when it comes to this financial stuff, there's no biometric signature whatsoever. It all relates to codes and keys and things and filing paperwork correctly and proper authentication. If you follow those steps exactly for someone else, it doesn't matter that they didn't do it personally. You are authenticated as them because that's all that matters because you're not in fact stealing their identity because the identity is contained only on paper with those keys. This means that you can dissolve someone's company simply by filing the appropriate paperwork with the appropriate authentication measures and somebody could come in to work one day and find out their entire company has been dissolved. And they would say, I didn't do it. And the other person would look at it and say, yes, you did because everything is authenticated correctly. Because that person doesn't actually exist in that context. The individual human entity does not control a company. Simply the paperwork, that's what controls the company. The name on the paperwork, social security number on the paperwork, various code access numbers on the paperwork, all of that stuff. That's an inherent weakness to the structure. So, a possible future scenario in which naturally this secret society controlled system will be gone because it's essentially the same idea as a crown corporation, but a little bit more advanced, 
it is inimical to humans, to human nature, to everything. And so it will go, but then what it will be replaced by will naturally be a more advanced version of the human liberation structure of the member-owned nonprofit, essentially. And that might include things like bioidentification for voting. In order to vote, you actually have a biometric authentication measure, either testing your blood, because we have technology to do that, a fingerprint analysis, facial re or a conglomeration of different methods for that. Either way, there will actually be a biometric signature. It will not simply be numbers and keys and a, a name on a piece of paper that gives you the ability to vote in the system because our voting systems are public theater. They're designed, they're frauds. A true voting system, as far as the future would go, would have naturally some sort of way to verify that the individual is in fact a living, breathing human being of that identity that's doing that. You would probably also have independent, in some ways, independent of foreign control, but in their own right, it would be another word, in their under their own oath, universal global federation or federated groups. That's where our word fed comes from, it's federation federal, also these being, of course, French, as we know it today. So a lot of these groups would basically be individuals that get together into a community for a common purpose. They would not be some sort of hierarchically structured society. In some cases, they might be. And then all of them essentially get together into a united federation, not necessarily based off of simple land borders, things like that. And, of course, in such a future context, there will be an end to this secret society control, which is the deep state, and they're not exactly that secret. Now, considering the context of this video, the next topic that would relate to the deep state club house, the clubhouse of the deep state, would of course be the forbidden knowledge, mostly protected by showmanship and sleight of hand or, or just plain line. This would of course be the idea of the information that specifically leads to human liberation movements and is desired to be controlled above all else to keep that from happening and naturally put that in the hands of the secret society, secretive societies in the clubhouse. This forbidden knowledge, once you know it, of course, is forbidden to us. And if you show and demonstrate your knowledge of it, then you can become a target of them because they don't want you knowing that stuff. It's forbidden to everyone else but them. And then, of course, naturally, that forbidden knowledge is controlled and structured in a certain way within their secret societies to ensure that um, you adhere to the rules of that society. So like I said before, there is a pattern with members in these secret societies where they tend to, especially in the lower levels, practice so-called magic, magic tricks, showmanship, illusion, card tricks, things like that. Sleight of hand, very surface level, deceptive practices. The, what I would term the four Ds of deception, diversion, distraction, and dazzle. The Freemasons are talked about a lot when it comes to secret societies, but as I can tell, they simply form one component, and they come from the French Maison or House, uh, Free House or Maison Livre, Libre, being probably more than likely the conceptual idea of a household or a freehold. <coughs> What they do is they build control and intelligence structures. This kid, their all-seeing eye that they put on everything can be found in data metrics. Data metrics being gathered as the all-seeing eye looking through things based off of the information gathered uh, of data metrics, measuring through data, information <laughs> measurements. And then naturally their pyramid structure, they're, they're all seeing eye at the top of a pyramid. Well, you find that with pyramid graphs, incorporations, and the corporate habits 
of documentation and how all that's done comes from structuring by the Freemasons. But there's other layers, such as you have metacraft, what some might call witchcraft, metaphysical craftsmanship, craft work, or otherwise the occult, culturine being the French culture. Now the first one on this would be the summoning of the dead or necromancy. And we can find these today in the idea of borrowing on dead people's estates, people who have died and borrowing against their estates, uh, which has to do, of course, with grave markers and things like that. Now, another way is the juridical entity, what we call a company or corporation, giving it personality, um, a, a personhood, as they call it in fiction theory, imbuing it with spirit, creating it to become real in some way that's a concept of necromancy raising it from the dead as it were and then this of course has to do with the book sabriel and the idea of charter magic when you charter something like a chartered city you are giving it permission to exist with the ability to revoke that essentially killing it that's all part of that idea and in the book sabriel the concepts revolve around a charter mage necromancer who, instead of raising the dead, puts them back to sleep using uh, pipes and stuff, and of course using symbols of charter magic. And this also relates to memory or memorials. Today we have a large number of memorials erected to different things, essentially giving life to fictions, things that didn't exist, people who didn't exist, but they construct the memorials and give a tangible point of verification for their lying. And also it has a lot to do with um, financial mechanisms. And all of these things revolve around the occult arts of the dead, what some might refer to as the Egyptian Book of the Dead. But that work only contains some of these concepts in it. The forbidden knowledge, as it were, don't mess with these forces. They're beyond you, you know. They don't want to channel evil spirits, you know, that kind of stuff. Next one would be, of forbidden knowledge, of course, would be energy. What some might call feng shui, or building energy. Now, this isn't just how you assemble your house, as they try to constantly teach you that whenever you mention the word feng shui, they're talking about, or they will say, oh, you're talking about organizing your house. Interior design, right? No. It has to do with how buildings are actually erected and the energy patterns they form. A lot of these buildings that we have today, they tear down the original structures through a lot of effort, mind you, because those things were built for permanence. And then they construct these temporary abodes, which are blank slates, where it doesn't matter who's occupying it, it's very easy to remove them and then put someone else in. It's just like a blank slate on a, a um, whiteboard or uh, those etch-a-sketches, where it's very easy to erase what was there and then put something new. That's the idea. That's the reason why all these buildings, like malls and stuff, that individual occupying it can easily vacate it and somebody else can go in there that's the concept there easy to recycle but also the idea with energy we find in the roundabout rivers of asphalt where nearly every city has a outer ring highway that uh, runs a, a energy circuit as it were versus a canal it's uh, asphalt of course and when you go to a city, you'll always notice that it's there's an energy to it. It buzzes like a hornet's nest. There's a, there's a constant energy in cities, constant buzzing. And that has to do a lot with the understanding of energy culturing or uh, energy craft, forbidden knowledge of energy. Coffee and caffeine also relate to this, as do fountain squares. But Fountain Squares would be an old example of individuals who understood these concepts of forbidden knowledge which have been forbidden to us by the uh, cardinal principle so-called school system. If you understand these things, it is not forbidden anymore, and you can leverage this knowledge. But 
they of course do not want you knowing that for the very implications of what you can do with this type of knowledge because it doesn't just have to do with erecting these giant buildings or anything like that the energy can be harnessed through understanding by any individual at all whatsoever our radio frequency technology of course is another example of this understanding of energy and how it works how energy is a component of natural reality radio frequency of course is what's behind our cell phones and things like that most people are limited in, in their understanding and thus are easily controlled through the technology other people might have a little bit more advanced understanding and then there are those who understand it completely and are not bound by any sort of electronical limitation but they might be bound by other limitations and so that's why understanding and studying energy can empower an individual to become more effective now the next one would of course be life this relates modernly to blood banks sustainable health and habitat husbandry adrenochrome poisoning and chemical related work now the main thing there with the habitat and health husbandry is that that relates to the concept of managing a livestock of which most most humans are the health system is all about managing health and the habitat habitat is possibly much more striking when it comes to zoos where the habitat of an animal is very important to its health but that animal of course is going to be kept alive born into in many cases and live their entire life in captivity and that is what we are that's how we are seen we are livestock who are ra born raised and live our lives in captivity and they manage our habitat and they manage our health without our choice mind you and then that's of course so they can extract things like adrenochrome and blood and other biological uh, products and things like that but it does all relate to the understanding of essentially life the forbidden knowledge around life and then you have concept and perspective this is another area of forbidden knowledge where you don't they don't want you to know the area they only it, want you to know maybe a, a very specialized very um divided part component so that you can be useful but not useful to yourself useful to them coded communications is one example symbols embedding meaning capturing attention habits practice and ritual this of course all has to do with the concepts behind perspective and concept knowing something in a certain way being able to look at something in different angles that type of thing sort of the abstract concept the abstract knowledge versus these other ones which are very much not abstract in some ways and in other ways they are but yeah and as far as the secret society goes other elements exist in the control structure with their particular assigned uses one of those is of course are the uh, is the society of jesus uh, societe de yesu or the jesuits french of course they govern financial realms and equity legal investment and they're of course ones that would keep numerical codes but they aren't technically speaking builders they're more of wielders of weapons they are the so-called army of god next you have the hermetic order of the golden dawn and that's going to relate to the medical and then they're the ones of course behind the red cross all the blood banks the blood drives those types of things the knights of columbus as far as i'm aware are the main is the main group behind the so-called law enforcement they're the corporate law enforcement of the front-facing entity that's controlled by these secret societies and act on their behalf they are not here for us they are here to control the habitat they're essentially like your zookeepers 
Now, this comes into the concept of how these secret societies practically control all the front-facing mechanisms, all the big corporations, all the so-called governments. Everything that we know is controlled by a secret society. The way that they do this is through lateral promotion from the societies. So if you think about how you've got two corporations, you've got two structures or organizations, and they both have a ladder scheme, a sort of pyramidical, hierarchical structure. Now, you raise up over here on this one, the secret society, and you raise up over here on the front-facing society. Well, your limit for how high you can go on the front-facing society is much lower than theirs, and when they get to a certain position in this other society, they laterally move to the top of the front-facing society. So every military in the world, every so-called government, every corporation, they all have the same people from the same club. They all know each other. They are all secret society individuals who get moved over and control from the top-down structure these different organizations, and that is how they control everything. So in the military, you don't have to, if you're in a secret society, of course, you don't have to go through basic training. You don't have to do any of the stuff that the other people do. You simply get moved over. You get given everything that you need to control that organization. If you are not a member of these secret societies in this system, then you can go nowhere. You have a limit, a cap, on how far they will allow you to move in the hierarchical structures. This control system is not based off of merit, capability, or competence, which is of course going to be an inherent weakness to their structure. It is simply based off of your membership in the club, the clubhouse, and how far you advance in that clubhouse. That's the reason why you constantly, in whatever place you go, you have the frat rat group of people who all know each other, who all go out and do extracurricular activities together, and they all get essentially handed things for no apparent reason. They just get handed titles, positions, money, whatever. They get just get handed stuff. That's because of their membership in the secret society, not because of what they do for the corporation or entity that they're currently in. And I personally experienced this many times, and as an example of some of these types of people, they always have a, a sort of um, playful demeanor. They, they don't have any seriousness to what they do. And in general, they have some sort of backstory, which won't add up. There was a particular individual in the Marine Corps I knew who claimed to be from a small town in West Texas, despite having none of the characteristics of that claim. Contrasted to somebody who I knew from uh, Dallas, Texas. Walked around in cowboy boots, cowboy hat, did all the Texan things. It was in the culture, right? That individual carried the culture. Because despite the so-called school system definition, the cardinal principles control structure, culture is something represented by the individual because they are cultured buy it. It is ingrained into their habits, it's ingrained into what they do, and only through the imposition of new habits, a new culture, can that eventually be receded. But there will always be a, a taint or a something left behind from that original culture. This other person, claiming to be from East, from West Texas, a small town, did not have any of the cultural identifiers for that nor did he have any of the cultural identifiers for the Marine Corps. The Marine, has its, Marine Corps has its own culture and its own cultural identifiers, and generally those who, do not, who don't have a delayed emotional response to an event, that's an indicator that they did not go through basic training. Most Marines, even if they can't control their emotional responses, will generally have some sort of delay, and that comes from standing in formation for hours and being trained to not show emotion, otherwise you get the repercussions of the drill instructors. Somebody who grew, grows up in a secret society, especially the silver spoon idea, they get given stuff, they don't have to go through the same things that other people do, and because they don't go through the same things other people do, they don't have bear the culture or the habit 
that's ingrained from that experience. And then, of course, naturally, the idea of coming from a small town on paperwork, that might look fine. And in reality, you can't really verify it without actually, actually, actually going there yourself. So it's, it's very convenient. And when you have multiple patterns that all add up, well, you can identify who that individual is for what they are. And there are many of people like that. They tend to coalesce together, they tend to know each other, and they tend to do extracurricular activities outside of work together as well. And they usually tend to have the same sort of frat rat clubhouse persona where they prank each other, but if you prank them back, then they get incredibly vindictive and offended. They simply, they can dish it out, but they can't take it. And so when we're looking at this idea of the deep state and the secret society, we need to understand the difference between a community and a society, of which the secret society control mechanism and the cardinal principles indoctrination mechanism, they desire that the idea of community and society be one, but they're not. They're different concepts. A community is simply a grouping of different people with similar culture, similar understanding, similar characteristics, and a similar perspective. Naturally, you can get people from different cultures that form into the same community, but generally there's something shared there that makes them a member of that community. Whereas a society is a rigid structure of rules. It's not inherently bad. Societies aren't bad. Communities aren't bad, but they can be. It all depends on what their purpose is, what they're for. Naturally, a community of murderers, they um, tend to revolve around the realm of death and things like that. It's not to say that that's a bad thing either. It's simply that's what it is. You could have a community of barbers. You could have a community of um, uh, of writers, you know. Uh, but that's indifference to a society of writers or a society of murderers or a society of thieves. The society imposes rules on the conduct of each individual within that societal structure. And naturally, as anybody who's not a part of the clubhouse is concerned, these secret societies are evil. Not necessarily because some of them do some particularly evil things of consuming humans, but mainly out of their desire to form us into a zoo, into a livestock operation of which we have our habitat and health controlled out of their desire to preserve their equity. Being a zoo animal is not particularly a desirable position to be in for most humans, I'd say. Now, one of the primary things that these secret society minions will do, the lower ones anyway, actually pretty much all of them, is they see martial valor as the primary issue, just like any farmer, a cow farmer, anybody who keeps cows, would see a particularly aggressive bull or anybody who works in a zoo would see an animal like an elephant or a rhinoceros or some of these other ones, especially the male ones with high testosterone levels as particular problems for controlling that environment. They can break out, they can smash things, they can do damage, and of course they can stand up to the workers who are there. So naturally when it comes to this concept, they wanna make you docile and they wanna target martial valor. One of the two ways that they do this is through posers and jesters. A poser will be somebody, and it's usually easiest seen through the so-called gay community lens, is that they specifically choose things that are designed to target martial valor, or what some might call masculinity. If for them it's a bad thing because naturally all of those things cause the herd to rise up against. It creates leadership followers you know, the herd will follow a strong leader. The herd of sheep will follow a ram. That's the strongest ram. The herd of, of deer will follow the strongest buck, with the biggest horns, the most martial valor. The ability to not just kill, but to impose a presence, right? And so they want to target that. Now, the posers, they adopt a... a the appearance of being that 
that's all they're, they are, is they're, they're, pose, they're posing. They're taking a position all based off of the idea of looking like something. It's all surface. They don't have any of the foundational structure to it, and they can be found out because of that. And then the next one are gestures, those that jeer. And when it comes to specific examples of this, the gay community roll their sleeves up, posing, and then they jeer at those that do it, such as the Marines, for being gay. And they constantly try to insinuate this stuff. Now in the book Hagakure, it states that homosexual activity will can bring shame for a lifetime. That's what they're trying to do. They're entire, attempting to impose the shame of gayness onto the Marine Corps to undermine the martial valor of that institution. It is a psychological coordinated strategic attack against the martial valor of the U.S. Marine Corps. And they did the same thing to the so-called samurai and other martial orders. They, this is a specifically a targeting of the the uh, martial valor, of course, and you can also find it with the gay community cho choosing the Wrangler, the Jeep Wrangler vehicle, as their primary quote-unquote gay person vehicle. That's a very masculine vehicle, off-road, recognized as a military vehicle as far as the Jeep goes from prior time, uh, prior time period. And so everything that's ever chosen and replicated throughout the controlled communication structure is designed to target, deride, and denigrate any martial valor and the idea of setting oneself up for an exemplary, physically imposing appearance. Not just that, but being well put together and concerned with skill, practice, and effectiveness. All of the components that you would find with martial valor. Now, the, as far as most people go, the, one of the primary weapons that's focused on to undermine someone's capability, which causes more damage than uh, actual failure, is the fear of making a mistake. And in many contexts, the actual fear of making that mistake is what causes more damage than the mistake itself. And this is usually done through uh, elements of dismissiveness, and habits. So they ingrain into your habits a fear a fear of everything. It starts, of course, with the fear of pain in the school system, where if you are in pain about something, then the idea is to make that pain go away. That first starts fear of pain. And then you get penalized for what they say to be wrong through uh, bad grades, arbitrary grading points, and other control mechanisms. And then that ingrains a fear of making a mistake, which causes a lot more damage than the actual making of mistakes. So those are some ways that they ingrain in, their ha in your habits. And then their minions from the secret societies go around and dismiss things all based off of a playbook. Oftentimes when you're the more you go and live throughout life and go places and do things, you'll find individuals who seem to repeat the same phrases, the same lines, and leverage the same exact tactics. Sometimes it might be one person that does this, and then it would be multiple people that do these together in the same way. It's because they are, in fact, operating off of a playbook. The culture of the secret society, which is based off of deception, trickery, posing, jesting, or jeering, and dismissiveness. Now, up, into, up to this point, we've talked about how they do things, and what they do, and in some cases their weakness. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what has been done to them. First, they start with protecting choice. When, in fact, it's the opposite. They want to protect their choice over you or anyone else that is not part of their clubhouse. So that's the reason why they can prank each other, but when someone does it to them, they completely lose their mind, and so do the other people around them, and they target you for being outside of their clubhouse and deeming, deigning to do something against any of their members. 
then they have a big issue when they have the leverage of pedophilia labeled against them. That's the response. You have the gay community who attacks Marshall Valor by posing and making things like all the habits of the Marine Corps, driving a Jeep, rolling your sleeves, doing all these things into gay things. And when you say, it's I'm not gay, they say you're overcompensating, right? This is a psychological strategy of attack. In contrast, people who are gay are doing so to groom children because they're pedophiles and they want to provide a sexual product of a young child to someone else who's got disturbing appetites. That's the response. This is part of the information war. Now, naturally, if you look at that and say, I'm on the side of the gay people, then you're on the side of pedophilia, which is in many ways far worse than being on the side of somebody who is uh, so-called homophobic, meaning fear of the same. And then that gets, of course, into the idea of them keeping child hostages, which is even in some ways even worse than the leverage of pedophilia as a charge, because if you're keeping child hostages, then you possibly, that is in some ways the worst thing you can do in the eyes of any human being is to leverage a child as a shield or protective mechanism. It is the ultimate form of cowardice. And... All of these things are leveraged in contrast to the cudgel that is being forced to recognize gay people as owning everything and having to do what they say simply out of a so-called sexual orientation choice. Naturally, you need a pretty strong response to something like that because of its ingrainedness in a, to our habits. And then finally... Those that engage in a methodical emphasis on politics generally are doing so as a form of distraction because politics, as we call it today, is public theater. Now, the, the, because of their ingraining in habits, there's one thing that can be leveraged against this mechanism where in 2020 it became the fact that everyone was forced to talk about politics whether you wanted to or not. But you can flip that on its head by specifically stating that politics is public theater and completely dismissing the whole thing altogether. And because they ingrained into our society the fact that you don't talk about politics and that's not politics if you're talking about one thing or another, well, there's always a way to look at it in a different angle and dismiss it. Because dismissiveness is a two-way, is a double-edged sword. They can dismiss you and you can just as easily dismiss them. In fact, in some ways, it's easier to dismiss them because they don't, they don't um, trouble themselves with something like foundation, personal foundation. Their foundation comes from their secret clubhouse organization, and they have to adhere to that, whereas some other individual who does not have to adhere to anything can in many ways cause far more damage to them than they can to that individual, and that is the main reason why their demise is coming and it's coming soon. And all those little frat rats and people in their little clubhouse, they are going to be in a lot of trouble. Finally, when you understand the concept of provenance and the idea of forming documents into a collection for authenticating falsehoods as they use it, well, that is another double-edged sword. Someone else can come along and authenticate them into a false manner, essentially make them the originators of some pretty heinous documents and authenticate them as something, essentially frame them for what they do. However, when you talk about a foundational structure being in force, in strength, Generally, strength comes from truth, and in many cases, the individuals in these secret societies are the utmost of the utmost detestability and usually very stupid. And they will succumb to an individual that is founded in the source. A 
Sorcerer. Uh, 